Hi, it's time to start a project. This is going to be part one in a series where I rebuild my late 1930s new tone time chime. And this was featured in another video, which I'll put one of those flags that pops up right here for you to go back and look at it if you want to. And today's part of the project is we're going to work on and service the clock mechanism. After that, part two will be the servicing the chime mechanism. And then part three probably will be the reassembly and testing the chime to see how it works. So let's go ahead and get this taken apart and see what we have to do to take the clock mechanism out. The cover is held on. There are supposed to be two screws, one here at the top and one down here at the bottom. The bottom screw is missing and the top screw is probably not the original screw. It is a slotted screw, but it's a regular steel screw. Or actually, it's a, yeah, it's a th little threaded screw. Ah, oh, see, it fell on the floor. What do I tell you about losing chime parts? We're gonna do what we always do, which is we're gonna put it in the cup. We probably will replace that. I'll find the little brass screws that will look nicer when it's all done. And with the screws out, we can take the cover and the clock off the base. I'm going to put the base aside for right now and let's look at what we have to do to take the cover apart. One of the things that's unique about these chimes, these early clock chimes, is the motor for the clock drive, the Telecron motor assembly, this is a 110 volt unit, not a 16 or 20 or 24 volt unit. It's got a regular power cord on it that you plug into a wall outlet. This is obviously not the original cord. Someone has replaced it at some point, but we'll end up doing something with it. But for right now, we need to get rid of this because it's just in the way. So I'm going to go ahead and snip this off and we'll untie this. And this will go in the trash over there. Now, I noticed that one of the terminals right here where the wire, where the cord was attached, it's come loose from the coil, although the wire is still attached. That's something that we can repair. And we need to take the little set knob off the bottom here. It's connected to a rod that goes up into the clock assembly. And to get that off, We'll probably need some way to hold the rod and turn the nut because it's probably somewhat stuck. So let me get a pair of pliers. One of the things that you have to consider if you're doing something like this is these are virtually irreplaceable units. There are no parts for these. I've been a Newtone service center for 36 years. And there were no parts available for these when I first started. And the odds of finding one or finding someone with parts is pretty much next to none. And I don't even know what the part situation was back in the day. And that doesn't really seem like it wants to come off. So let's investigate and see if we can find another way to make it come loose. So after closer examination, I realized that the little knurled knob right here that you turn to set the clock has a reverse thread on it. And that's why it didn't want to come off. So there's that. Where does that go? In the cup. Once we've taken that loose, I'm going to go ahead and snip off a little bit more of this wire that was on the cord. Because as you can see, this is sort of flopping around here. And we're going to see if we can not have that break off. Once I've done that, I think to get the clock mechanism out, we have to take the motor assembly apart. Now, these are not terribly difficult to figure out, although there are some little tricky parts to it. There are two screws here which go down through these large brass standoffs and then screw into the body of the clock down here. So I'm gonna go ahead and take those out. And I think by doing that, we'll be able to parts in the cup. We'll be able to lift the motor assembly off the back of the clock mechanism.
And one of the things to notice is these brass standoffs have these little tabs on them. See the little tab? This part right there. They sit underneath the Telecron gear drive assembly when you reassemble it. So these sit on here like this with the tabs pointed inward like this. And that provides, I think, some kind of tension on the assembly to keep it from working loose, most likely. So you have to keep that in mind when you put it back together. Parts go in the cup. Here's our Telecron motor drive assembly. And we'll take a closer look at that in a minute. And now what I want to do is I want to take the clock mechanism out of the cover. Because one, the, the dial, the... Uh, glass, I guess maybe it's called the crystal. It's a crystal on a watch. I'm not sure what it is on a clock exactly, but that's going to be my guess. I think what we have to do is bend these tabs, straighten them out, so we can take the bezel off the glass, and I think the whole thing will lift out. But I don't know exactly because I've never done one of these before. So we'll carefully bend up the tabs a little bit with a flat screwdriver. And then we'll take our needle nose pliers and we'll stand each one of them up nice and straight so they're not twisted. And in theory, do the last one here. The bezel around the glass should lift off. Of course, it's never quite as easy as you would think, and I'll show you why. There we go. So we'll lift that out. And see, then the clock mechanism wants to go through the opening, and then you've got to wiggle the rod out of its hole and slide the whole thing out as one piece. We'll put that aside. Let's look at the cover for a second. Of course it's kind of dirty and it's got this sort of textured kind of finish on it. It's in pretty good condition but there's some paint here, some wall paint, and there's a little chip in the finish right here. And it has these four decorative bands on it and these are also applied pieces they go the ends go around the corners and then they're crimped and bent over on the cover to hold them in place so we could take those off if we need to and obviously it's really dirty inside so it needs to be cleaned this will be another part this will probably end up being more than three parts so here's our clock mechanism and here are the four tabs that we unbent and of course there's two more tabs. So why was this tricky? Why, even though we straightened the tabs out, why didn't it just pop right out? Well, because when the tabs were bent over, there's a little crinkle in them right there. And that was enough to kind of make it stay in place. And if you very carefully, you can probably just straighten those out with the needle nose pliers a little bit. And then we need to unbend the other two. that. Let's we'll see if we can do like this. The risk you take with this is things like this, once they're assembled, they probably, it probably really wasn't designed to be taken apart and then put back together again. I suppose you could if you had to, but you have to be really careful, especially when you have things like bent over tabs, because they were bent over once to hold it in place when it was made, and now you're unbending it, and when you put it back together, you have to bend it again. And if you do all of that and you're not really careful, or if you're just unlucky, sometimes the tabs will crack and break off, and that would be bad. Uh, this apparently is made out of brass, or maybe it's brass plated, I don't know. Let's see if we have a magnet here. 
This is how you can test to see if it's brass or steel. This is a high powered magnet and it's not magnet magnetic or as my kids used to say, magnetic. So it's probably solid brass and the tabs where it's been covered up are shinier than the ring itself. So this will probably get polished up so it looks new when we're done with it. And then we can take the glass off. Of course you want to be really careful with the glass because Perhaps you could find a new one, but doing that would be kind of tricky. And there seems to be on the inside, I don't know if you can hear that, some kind of residue. And possibly it's from the dial face itself, or maybe it's left over from bugs. I don't know why. And there's also some paint and junk on the outside, so this needs to be cleaned thoroughly because it's kind of hard to see through at the moment. And now we have our clock assembly. So the goal today is to see if we can get the mechanism off the backing plate, or maybe it's part of the backing plate, I don't know exactly. But to do that, we have to remove the hands so we can remove the dial. So that's what we're gonna do next. So let's see if we can remove the hands from the clock. To do this, there's lots of different styles that were used over the years. This one, the hands are just pressed on to the spindle or whatever you call it that comes out of the motor. Sometimes on some models, there's like a little neural nut that you have to take off and then the hands come off, but this isn't that type. So these are just sort of a press fit. And each one of the hands, like right here, this is the second hand, right here, from the center where it fits onto the shaft to the outside, there's a little slot in it. And that way when you push it on, it opens up just a little bit and it's like a friction fit. So what we're gonna try to do is very carefully, see if we can carefully sort of pry it up. and get it to come off. That didn't want to move very much, so let me get something. So one of the tricks here is, because we do need to pry it up to get it to slide off the shaft, but we don't want to pry against the black hands because then we're gonna damage the finish. So what I did was I took a little piece of cardboard and I made a slot in it, which we're gonna slide on like this. And now when we pry, we're prying against the cardboard and we're not gonna scratch the black hands. like that. See? Now you can pry freely and it's better. Now one of the things which I don't know if you'll be able to see really well or not, if I show you the hands here, the second hand, and maybe you can see if I hold it just right like that. It's not actually flat and straight. It actually has a little bit of bend in it right here. Now is that original? Is it supposed to be bent like that? Or is it supposed to be straight? Was it bent by the guy that assembled it, or gal, back in the 30s? I don't have any idea. Has this been taken apart before in service and the last guy who worked on it bent it? I don't know that either. But that's the way it is and that's the way we're gonna leave it because that's the way we found it. So we'll put that up there. We're gonna put those away carefully in a minute. And now we need to remove the hour hand and we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna slide the cardboard between the two hands, I think it'll fit like this to protect them. And then we're gonna carefully pry this one up a little bit. And if you need to, you have to turn the cardboard because when you do this, you don't wanna just pry on one side, you wanna sort of pry all the way around to make it pop off. So there's our hour or our minute hand. And that one, see that one's got, see if you can see that. See that's got a little bend in it also. So my guess is that that's the way they were made. Either that or some guy at Newtown in the 30s. See now we need to make our slot a little bigger because we're moving down from the from the end of the shaft into the part that's a little larger diameter. So we'll make our cut out a little bigger here. Some guy who worked at Newtone, or gal, in the 30s, 
when they were on 3rd and Eggleston Avenue in Cincinnati, Ohio, was putting this together on a Friday, and he was in a hurry because he was going to go out with his buddies. And there's the hour hand, and the hour hand seems to be straight. So, who knows? Was in a hurry and bent the hands. I don't know. Just a thought. So once we've done that, now we can take the dial face off. The dial face, along with the other decorative parts, that's the money piece right there. So that'll get wrapped up and put away. I'm not going to do anything to this. I might lightly brush it off with a bristle brush. And in fact, let me show you what's a good thing to use on that. I keep these here. So brushing things to clean them is a really good thing to do because it's easy. Now, you can use paint brushes and things, and of course they're available in all kinds of sizes. What I keep here on the workbench, and I use these every single day, are, I have this, and I have this one. I have these two. These are natural bristle brushes, and these are actually pastry brushes. These came from some cooking store that's in our town. And the thing that the advantage to these are they're not terribly expensive. They come in a lot of different sizes and they seem to last pretty much forever. So that's a good thing to have if you do a lot of this. And probably all we'll do with this, is we'll just lightly brush it off in case there's any dirt and stuff on it. It's got sort of a speckly finish over the numbers a little bit. And I'm not sure, I don't think it's because it's falling apart basically. I think it's just the way it was made. It was probably the style of the day. So we'll just leave that like that because that's really the best part. And fortunately, so here we now we have our backing plate here. And we have three probably machine screws that hold the mechanism to the backing plate. So if we take these out, yeah, see, they're a little machine screws like that. So where do those go? Those go in the cup. Like that. And we can lift the backing plate off like this. And there is a little brass bushing right here in the center that seems to be affixed to the metal plate. This is steel, I'm pretty sure. We'll get our magnet out again and see. Yep, see, if it's ferrous, if it's steel, then the magnet will stick. So it looks like the little brass bushing was put in place and then it's sort of peened or crimped over on this side to hold it on. So we're not going to mess with that, although we will clean this up. We're going to clean everything up. And so now here's our clock drive assembly in all of its fanciness. And what do we have here? Well, we have a variety of gears. And of course, the gears will all simply come apart now. And this is the part that gets tricky because at the end, when it's all clean, it has to all go back together. And this is one of the advantages of doing this on a video is that I get to see how it comes apart and I can always go back and refer to the video because unlike my friend Marv, the clock guy, who always says, oh, it's not a problem, it only goes back together one way, that's easy for him to say because he's a clock guy and I'm not. So we'll take this, the first gear number one slips off of this assembly right here and I'm going to describe each one of these so I can go back and look and see how to put it back together. So you have this dual gear assembly here. So that's gear number one. This one has to come off next because it's on top of this one. So we'll lift that one off and it has a little gear on this side and a little gear on that side. So it goes this way. See, and I'm kind of putting them, sort of spacing them out in order. And then this one lifts off this shaft here. And it has a bushing and it looks like some kind of little three-legged keeper thing on the bottom. I'm sure there's a clock term for that, but here we're going to call it a three-legged keeper thing. So that one goes there. And then this one has to come off next because it's sitting on top of that one. So this will come off. I guess. 
I hope. Should come off, but it doesn't seem to want to. So we'll give it a little, we'll give it a little encouragement here. How about that? Of course, we don't want to bend anything. And it seems to be stubborn. Uh, see, now this fell off. So maybe we should do that next. So what is this? Uh, let's see if we can get this back in place here. See, this is what happens. This is the unexpected part of the whole thing. So this is a little flag here. And this is kind of important. And this pivots. It's supposed to pivot. Wait. Let's see if we can get it to pivot here. No, not like that. No, not like that either. I could go back and watch the video and see how it pivots. But I don't want to do that. That would be kind of like cheating. There we go. I think that's right. I will go back and check. Plus, we have to take it apart to see. So what is this for? Well, this side is gold and this side is red. The thing about this is, and I've done a video about this, this Telecron gear drive assembly, this is called a synchronous self-starting motor assembly. What does that mean? That means that as soon as you plug it in and there's power to the coil, the motor starts to run instantly. And that was a big deal back in the 30s. I assume it was a big deal because at some point before that, motors, when you plug them in, you have to start them somehow. Maybe you have to spin something or turn something or do something. They weren't self-starting motors, apparently. Because if you look at catalogs for all kinds of different clocks, just not Newtone clocks, the whole self-starting motor thing is a big deal that they always talk about. Oh, it's a self-starting clock. So it obviously was a big deal. And since it's an electric clock that you plug in and you're counting on it keeping good time, and that way you know what time it is, if the electricity goes out and it stops, this little flag moves and the red shows through the opening in the dial in the face where so you can see this right here and it's, so it's an indicator that tells you that the electricity went out and now you know the time on the clock is probably wrong because if the electricity went out at noon and it was out for an hour and a half when you came home the time would be off by an hour and a half but if there wasn't an indicator to tell you the power went off, you wouldn't know. Because in the 30s, you didn't have a VCR or a microwave with a clock on it that would blink every time the power went off. So that was the only way you could know. So it was an important feature and a lot of Newtone clocks have that. So we'll take this off and we will review when we put this back together where how that goes. So that goes there. And then we still have to figure out how to get this one off. This one, this lever, here, which has to do with the indicator, has a little spring right here and it's resting up against this post and probably something on the back of the lever, so it's springy. And that's, I think, what trips it to make it flip when the electricity goes out. I'm not gonna mess with that because I don't think it's really necessary and I'm not sure how it's held on here exactly. It looks like the pivot shaft right here that it fits around has a groove in it and there's a little tiny springy piece of wire in the groove that holds the arm in place and we're not going to mess with that because that's one of those kind of things that if it goes sprawling across the room unexpectedly and you won't ever be able to find it and trust me you won't trying to figure out a replacement will be difficult you know you think oh, i can use an e-clip or something like that but for some reason that probably won't work and sometimes it's best to leave well enough alone so that's what we're going to do and then you have the rod here which went down through the bottom of the cover of the clock with a little knob on the end that you use to set the clock. And we're gonna, we're gonna leave that alone also because it goes through this fairly complicated little assembly right here that's peened over on the back side of the plate to hold it on. And we're not gonna mess with that either because I don't think it's worth it. But I do wanna get this gear off and I think what I see here is that there's actually a little keeper. So on this side of the plate, 
here's the back side of the shaft that that gear fits around or onto, and it's peened over onto the metal plate to hold it in place. And then the gear was slipped down over it. And then on the end of the gear right here is a little brass washer with a slot or maybe no slot, I don't think there's a slot. A little brass washer and it's peened over on that also. So we're not gonna take that apart because that's one of those kind of things that if you get it apart, you may not ever get it back together or it wasn't meant to be taken apart. And of course, as I was turning it around and explaining, the little gear here that goes in the center fell out. So that means that that just fits in there like that. We'll take that out again, put that there. So this is as strip down as this is going to get but I think that's all right because this will go in the ultrasonic cleaner and it should be okay and then these will go in the ultrasonic cleaner what we're going to do first is one of the things that you're supposed to do when you work on stuff like this is you're supposed to inspect it and look for wear in the teeth on the gears now I'm not a clock guy and I'm not a gearologist guy but wear on gear teeth is wear on gear teeth. And the other thing I've noticed, and I worked on another clock with gears a while ago, is that you get a lot of gunk and crud that builds up in the teeth of the gear. And you wanna make sure it's clean so everything moves freely and meshes freely because one set of teeth mesh with the other set of teeth. And it's interesting, like this one, this is the second one I think we took out with the little three arm thingy that holds the gear on this side in place. This gear actually turns independent of this gear. So I don't know why that is exactly because not being a clock guy. This one in particular, this is the one that went down in there. This one has a lot of crud, not only on the surface of the brass gear, but also in the teeth of the gear. So this one has to be clean. And of course, all of these little shafts and things have to be clean so they're smooth. And this one's all gummy and sticky. It's got greasy residue all over it and stuff like that. One of the things that you're not supposed to ever do with a clock is you're never supposed to spray WD-40 or any kind of spray lubricant anything in it or anything like that. The only thing you're supposed to do is when you reassemble all of this, on any point where it pivots or turns or on the shafts, you can put one little tiniest drop of like instrument or clock oil on it to lubricate it. And that's all you ever are supposed to do. All of that, you don't need lubrication on all the teeth of the gears or anything because it's a highly designed and precise kind of thing. And you simply don't do that. One of the other things we're not gonna do, because all of this is gonna go in the ultrasonic cleaner. One of the things we're not going to do is we're not going to put this assembly in the ultrasonic cleaner because what could happen is the ultrasonic cleaner could easily take off the painted finish on the flag and I don't want to do that. So this will get cleaned by hand not everything is an automatic solution. Sometimes you have to do some things by hand. The other thing we're gonna do, I'm gonna do now before I put this in is, you can see how dirty this is here. Um, we're gonna clean a little bit of this by hand first to get the major grime off of it. And then when we put it in the cleaner, ultrasonic cleaner, it will turn out better. So what are we gonna clean this with? All we're gonna use is we're gonna use a little bit of alcohol and I have a brass brush, and I have a little bit of bronze wool. This is like steel wool, only it's not made out of steel, it's made out of bronze. And it's better for this kind of stuff because steel wool will scratch things and the bronze wool will not. So, and you can buy bronze wool, surprisingly enough, on Amazon. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna spray a little bit of alcohol. And you can see, what a good job it does. You would think, oh, why is he using alcohol? That's not the right thing to do. I've got some kind of heavy duty solvent-y kind of junk in my garage that's been on the shelf since 1972 when I rebuilt a carburetor on my Ford Mustang. I'm gonna use that. I would recommend that you rethink that idea because alcohol actually is a really good cleaner. 
works really well. It dries really quickly. You don't have all kinds of ob obnoxious fumes and things. And of course, I am wearing gloves when I do this. It's something I'm trying to do more often nowadays. Even though I think after 40 years of not wearing gloves, it probably has minimal help. But we do what we can. And if you use a brass brush, since we're brushing on steel or on brass gears, it's not going to scratch anything. So that's a pretty good start. See, it took me, what, two minutes to clean up that much of it. And now when we put it in the ultrasonic cleaner, it's that much less that the ultrasonic cleaner has to clean. And all I'm going to do is just sort of lightly go over this. Turn that. And we'll maybe give it a little bronze wool treatment here. It's particularly grimy on the edges. The other nice thing about alcohol is when you're done with the cleaning and you wipe it off, you can always you can always rinse it in water because alcohol is water soluble. And then if you want to dry it off thoroughly, which I recommend, you can put it in your handy dandy workshop toaster oven and you set it for about 180 degrees and you leave it in there for about 20 minutes and it will totally evaporate all the water. Now if you have something with plastic parts I don't recommend you do that because you're going to melt the plastic but it's not a bad way to go. So that's much much cleaner to start with and now I want to do this rod right here because it's got a lot of grime on it. And if you use the brass or the bronze wool, it'll take a lot of it off the surface. And that's pretty good. Probably what we'll do with this at the end, this is probably steel. Let's check it and see. Yes, it is. So some of what we're see what I see on here is probably surface rust or corrosion because it's steel. And so after we clean it in the ultrasonic cleaner, what I might do is use some like 3000 grit sandpaper and lightly polish it up so it looks shiny again. You wanna make sure that you don't mess up the threads on the end right here where the little neural knob goes on because then you won't be able to put that on properly. So that looks pretty good. Put that aside. And then these little gears, they're not bad. This one is the worst out of all of them. This was the last one, the one that fell off when I was explaining something. So we'll just lightly brush off some of the grime. And same thing on this side with the little gear. The last time I did one like this, after I did all this, and after we did the ultrasonic cleaning three times, and all that, then you sit there very carefully with a dental pick and you remove the last of the grime that's in the teeth of the gears because it doesn't always want to all come out. But that's pretty good to start with. So those are the major ones. These four, three, they're not bad. 
So all we're going to do with that is put them in the ultrasonic cleaner. So let me get that set up and I'll show you and then I'll show you what I'm going to do next. And here are our parts in the basket for the ultrasonic cleaner. This assembly is too long to be immersed. The, the bottom part will be immersed totally. The rod will not be. So I'll alternate it back and forth. I'm not as worried about the rod as I am the rest of it, but that's how it fits if you have a small one like we're using for the clock part. And here's the ultrasonic cleaner. The flashing numbers are only because of the difference between the shutter speed on the camera and the multiplex of the display. Not a big deal. Here's our parts inside. Sorry about the handheld part, but that's the only way I can do this. We'll go ahead and turn this on. Pretty exciting, isn't it? Now, if you have one of these, or you get one of these, when you run it, put the cover on it. Make it really noisy. I'll put a rag over the top of it that helps cut down the rattle. I'm going to run this for probably three 10 minute sessions and then I'll flip all the parts over and run it for three more and see how everything looks. There isn't a definite preset amount of time you should do this. You run it until you make sure that it um, is clean. What are we using to clean it with? We're using this. This is from the Clockworks company and this is Clock. Uh, cleaning, ultrasonic cleaning, clock part concentrate, and that's what's inside. Diluted to the recommended amount. Okay, so while our gears are being ultrasonically cleaned, I'm going to clean the backing plate for the clock, and I'm going to do that exactly the same way as I did the other metal pieces, which is a little bit of alcohol and some bronze wool. And we'll see how clean we can get it. Do that. And that. That's a pretty good start. Although these darkened areas I would have thought would have come cleaner at that point. So what we'll try is a little bit of metal polish. And we're still going to use our bronze wool because that is good. It won't scratch it. And the metal polish has a very fine abrasive in it. If it's good enough to polish a chrome bumper, it should be good enough to polish a steel plate. And as you can see, there's a lot of grime. And this is one of those kind of things that you just work at until you're happy with it. Wash it off a little bit. And that's already much, much better especially compared to that side. And I'm gonna spare you watching me sit here for the next 20 or 25 minutes cleaning this, but that's the general idea and I will show it to you when I'm done with it before we reassemble. The other things I'm gonna do off camera are I'm gonna polish the brass bezel for the glass, but I think before we wrap up this part of the video, we'll flip this over and we're gonna take a little bit of a look at our glass. And as I showed you before, it's got some kind of sort of crunchy residue on the inside. And I don't want to use anything like the brass wool or the brush or anything that's going to scratch the glass. You're replaceable. If it falls on the floor and you break it, you're out of luck. So what are we going to use? Well, we're going to use a good old standby. We're going to use some Windex. Because Windex is good for everything. Whatever is in there is leaving some kind of brown stuff. What we might have to do, do the outside here too. Yep, pretty dirty.
is the residue stuff, which I think is maybe part of the finish from the dial. Seems to be kind of stuck, but a lot of it came off. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take this, I'm going to take some paper towels, put them in here. I'm going to spray it, put paper towels, wet the paper towels with the Windex, and put it in a plastic tub and let it sit for an hour or so, and see if that'll help break loose the particles that are stuck to the inside of the glass and then hopefully they'll just wipe away. So that's going to be the end of part one. Part two, I guess, will be we'll deal with the motor assembly here and once all of the polishing and cleaning and everything is done, then we'll reassemble everything and see if it works. So that's the end of part one. Look forward to part two coming soon. I hope you found this interesting and perhaps for someone it will be helpful. If it is, please give it a thumbs up. Thumbs up on YouTube because that helps us a little bit. There will be a banner right here that shows you how to subscribe. Go to our YouTube homepage. Click on the bell. And when you click on the bell, click on it to receive all notifications. And every time we post a new video, you'll get a notification and you can watch it. That's all for today. See you on the next video.